A hundred years ago, Dr. Henry Maudsley was one of the leading psychiatrists of the day and made a donation to set up the hospital. And he was wanting to tackle the stigma that was associated with being sent to the asylums. 300 years ago, these two statues of raving madness and melancholy madness summed up most people's view of mental illness. We've gone a long way since then. The majority of our patients are being supported with their mental health needs in the community. Very few patients end up in hospital, and when they do end up in hospital, we're very keen for them to, to stay there only as long as there is a need. I think the approach here is that change is possible, and no matter how long someone's had a problem and no matter how much it's affected their life, well, that's not an acceptable status quo. What you can do is you put everything you can into changing that person's life with them rather than for them. It's very interesting, looking back to 1908, Henry Maudsley, when he made the case for this institution, made the case for an institution that was going to provide the best possible care for patients, the best possible science and research, and the best possible education. I think we're doing that, but we're doing it in a, the context of the 21st century. There's been a real revolution in mental health care with the closure of the Victorian asylums and the establishment of community-based services. And of course, that's what Henry Maudsley founded this hospital in order to achieve. He thought it would be a good idea to have services that were intended to get people better and to look after them and keep them well, rather than simply to remove them from society. A hundred years ago, the exciting new science was around microbiology and understanding single causes and looking at what was going on in the brain for the first time. Now, the exciting bits of science are around what's called genomics, understanding the whole of the genome, the power of DNA-based biology, and also neuroimaging, understanding what's going on in the brain in a living patient rather than in Maudsley's time after patients had died. What we can do now is bring the power of this modern biology, modern neuroimaging, modern psychotherapy to patient benefit. At one end of the spectrum, we'll be using the MR scanner on a day-by-day -day basis for diagnosis. So we'll get a patient in, we're concerned that they may have Alzheimer's and we use it for diagnosis. At the other end of the spectrum, we're developing new techniques, starting to look at how they might be applied, sometimes um, for the very first time in the world. The most special feature about the Maudsley is the fact that you bring scientists and clinicians together. I think here we do a very good job of taking some of the sort of cutting edge research and using it at the coal face. It means that we really get a chance to, to see life changing uh, things happening to people and, and to be part of that. The application of bench to bedside is very important for the patients and the service users that we actually work with. They actually benefit enormously from leading edge clinicians, research to their lives in the community. One of the things that helps research be translated from bench to bedside quickly here is the fact that researchers and clinicians work together. In fact, researchers sometimes are clinicians. It means we can do things faster, it means we can do things more effectively, it means we can get to those cures, those diagnostic tests in a way that is really quite unique. There are very few places in the world where you go right the way through from understanding patients at the bedside, through to the bench and back to patients again. We do the whole thing. So in this bench to bedside translation, one of the things that we use more and more often are fruit flies. Frank, what have you got here? So these are fruit flies that model Alzheimer's disease and we are using them to identify compounds that protect against disease formation. And the really fantastic thing about these studies is that we can do them so quickly. So Frank can make these models in a matter of months because the, the fruit flies come and go so quickly. It also means we can very precisely alter the genes that we're interested in, in individual neurons, individual brain cells in the fly. We can understand what these genes are doing in a way that we've never been able to do before.
We're in the healing garden at the River House. It's a unit for medium secure patients. Only been open two weeks and it's a fantastic provision. For all of us, the kind of environment that we are in helps us to feel better. So if the place that we are in is comfortable, we have our basic needs met, which is an important factor for anyone who's got mental health problems. We need to raise the standards of inpatient care. It needs to be the kind of environment that people who need to be in treatment for long periods of time can find acceptable and can find therapeutic as they move on the way to recovery. It represents everything really about being ambitious, being bold, client care, patient-centred, good clinical practice in here and a link with the research from the Institute of Psychiatry. One of the real benefits we have at the Institute of Psychiatry is being next to the Morsley Hospital and being part of the whole South London and Morsley Trust. And of course that gives us the real opportunity to do clinically rooted research and to have access to patients and for patients to actually benefit from the sort of things that we're doing. Many of the people who are doing the research are people like me who are both clinicians and scientists. The relationship with the Morsley means that uh, if we discover something that we can implement, we can do it straight away. We're increasingly collecting samples that number in the thousands or even tens of thousands and the necessity to generate data quickly means that we have to invest in pieces of equipment like this. This is our robot which we use to transfer samples between plates. Using equipment like this and the very large sample collections that we have accumulated allows us to generate results very quickly that are of clinical relevance. One of the studies we're interested in at the moment is not just finding out the genetic basis of depression, but finding out the genetic basis of response to treatment, and we're getting somewhere with that. So I see some way down the line really exciting developments in the area that's called pharmacogenetics, that's to say using genetics to predict who will respond to treatment, and not just drug treatments, uh, response to psychological therapies as well. The psychological therapies developments are very much within the Maudsley tradition where you use sound experimental um, investigations to focus on what is the core in a particular disorder and then use that information to develop the most efficient treatments. The big advantage is that the effects are relatively enduring. People learn something new about what makes them vulnerable to emotional problems and so the benefits that they gain tend to be sustained. Whereas with medication, when you withdraw the medication, there's a high risk of relapse. The key thing for talking therapies is to make them as accessible as possible. And that means making them available near people's homes and at hours when they can come in. So a big emphasis at the moment is to provide therapies uh, in the evenings, at weekends and near people's homes. I think the biggest advance over the last two decades uh, is that the brain has come to be right in the center of psychiatry. With the appearance of imaging and different kinds of imaging, we can now look at the brain circuits, we can now look at the brain molecules and pinpoint, almost like neurologists can, precisely what is wrong with which circuits when in different psychiatric illnesses. I think one of the biggest trends for me is thinking more about well-being rather than illness. Um, mental health services for a long time have been mainly concerned with um, dealing with illness, um, but actually there's a shift in terms of thinking about well-being. Many employers don't want people with mental health problems to work in their workplace, but by educating employers and getting them on our side, it's really proven that people actually can access employment who are in recovery. People who I've worked with actually do report back to me saying they feel much better, they feel valued and they feel as though they've re-entered their local community. What's particularly exciting for me personally is the way that we're able to offer in very brief treatments which are almost entirely effective in a very short time. So for specific phobias, for example, we can treat uh, the problem in about three hours. The qualities that you need to have as a nurse here will be patience, tenacity, if you're a patient in hospital, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, very stressed, very confused, away from your family, it will be the nurse that will be there with you. Staff and patients work collaboratively on a pathway towards discharge and they make that journey together. Mm -hmm.